Thank you. Still very early. I haven't been up this early and I don't know how long, probably since secondary school. I'm not a morning person by any means. <laughs> Yeah, so today I'm going to speak about honesty and I haven't really, I suppose, prepared this talk much because I didn't want it to be really like rehearsed because uh, I wanted it to be honest. And then um, someone pointed out to me, I said I didn't put, get time to put my makeup on this morning and she's like, oh, that's honesty and um, this is how I look. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm going to talk about something that's recently happened this year and um, how it's kind of changed my perception on things. So uh, just uh, the first slide. Um, so this is uh, me in a uh, primary school, and it's 1995. And um, the first time I realised I was different was when my friends were running into their house and their nana slammed the door in my face. I didn't know why. Um, I just thought I was really annoying because that's what I was told constantly growing up that. Um, I was, you know, I was too whiny. I was always, I was too sensitive, all these kind of things. And then um, I started school a year earlier when I was four and uh, I got kept back. And um, I basically, you know, I went through school kind of not being able to focus and um, not really kind of understanding why I was there and really kind of had a hard, difficult time in school. And I kind of, I, I, I was very hyper as well and uh, nobody really knew why. I used to come out with like really bizarre things and say things and I'd be colouring things so much so that my teachers would tell my mum, you know, what is she drawn kind of thing. So drawn was always my thing and I'd always express myself through drawn. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd just come out with the most random things. Like there was a time that we were driving by um, the, this couple who had just got married and they were getting their uh, pictures taken on a kind of a field. I think it was actually at the back of St. Anne's where you can see like the sea as well. And um, we pulled up in my friend's mom's car and she goes, oh, look at the bride and groom. They're lovely, aren't they? You know, wave at them and start beeping. And I was sitting closest to the window when I was about six and I wound down the window and started screaming out of it. Hey, do you shave your armpits? <laughs> and the groom just looked up and was like, and I was like, no, your wife. <laughs> so um, that kind of sums me up as a child in a nutshell, really. Like, And then... Um, yeah, so I was kind of, I was out there, I suppose, and um, I, I had a wild imagination. There was another time that my uh, granduncle showed me a dead ginger cat on the road on my nana's cul-de-sac, and my instant reaction to it was, can I put that in the wardrobe? <laughs> so I just thought it would make a nice jacket. I was four, you know, you can't say it. I didn't know any better. But um, uh, next slide. I'm not going to do myself any injustice by posting a picture up here of me as a teenager because... Um, <laughs> It, it, it was awful, so I'll post. This is an actual picture of my disc man. Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of... I, I used to wear those green jackets with the your little kind of army thing on it and all writing all over it. Um, 90s cornrows that I used to get my mum to do every night. I'm aware I'm not black, but... Um, <laughs> try telling me back that back then. But, um, yeah, so music would have been a big thing for me growing up as well. And growing up as a teenager was kind of difficult for me because I knew that I was different, but I didn't know why. And I just felt like I didn't really fit in. And I started to kind of mimic other people around me and friends around me. So, like, if there was the cool girl in the gang, like, I'd dress exactly the same as her uh, until it, up to the point that she'd actually turn around to someone else and be like, the fuck? Like, what's... <laughs> And uh, I didn't know why I was doing it. And um, even in through secondary school, I would have been really abrupt and couldn't concentrate, didn't do well in school. I think I got like 240 in my leave insert and uh, just barely scraped maths, which I was absolutely delighted about because, uh, yeah, we all know, like I'd say half the people in this room probably felt the same down their leave insert and maths. But um, yeah, so I went to going to school then in um, 2004 and I left in 2009. And I went to college and each change, I suppose, that happened, um, wh whether I was going through primary school, secondary school uh, or into college was a big kind of change for me. Like, And it took me a long time to kind of adapt. But um, it was only after I finished college in 2015, it was this is the next slide. Um, I finished college in 2015 and I had absolutely nothing going on. I studied graphic design and I wanted to be an illustrator so I couldn't get a job anywhere. And uh, it was that, yeah, pretty much. 
Um, so I basically, um, I had finished college. There was nothing going on the summer. So I had set up like my year one Nikita page and started working on that. But in the background of that, I wanted to meet my biological dad. Um, I found out when I was six that my dad, who is my dad over here, I've got two dads, it's kind of complicated. So I have my dad who has adopted me over here. And then this is my biological dad, who I absolutely knew nothing about other than his first name, didn't know where he was born, didn't, well, I knew where he was born, didn't know his ba- date of birth, um, nothing like that. And um, I decided I wanted to find him after my mom passed away because I just wanted to see who he was. I wanted to make my own mind up, but I didn't want to do that when my mom was there because I knew she was a bit kind of skeptical. And um, so I I basically got onto an agency called Finder Monkey. They're based in the UK. And uh, I asked them if they were able to find him basically with the little or no information that I had. I had one potential kind of place that he could have lived from someone that my mom lived with when she was in London. And then... Um, I basically gave over all that information and they said it could take up to three months because there was so many Mark Saunders in, you know, London between 47 and 53. And I said, yeah, that's no problem. And then it was about two weeks after that, I was just coming out of Nando's and uh, I got a phone call saying that they found him. And I was like, holy shit, me and my friend are just standing there. I'm like, oh my God. And the first thing we did was went over to my friend's house. We smoked a joint and we got a bottle of wine and we looked up his house on Google Maps. And um, (laughs) and I was like, what if he's a millionaire? What if he's a millionaire? Like, you know, this is me. Like, this is, uh, uh, you know, this. And we looked up on Google Maps and um, he could not have lived in a more grimmer place in in the UK, (laughs) if I imagined. Um, At first, I thought it was a joint house, but it turns out it was a block of flats. But... um, (laughs) But um, this is the day that uh, we met. We spoke on the phone first before I went over. And um, he, my dad was kind of a character because uh, the, the agency done the initial induction. like, And they said, yeah, he said that's no problem to call after 7 o'clock. And I was like, oh, my dad's got a job. I was like, yeah. And um, then I called him at 7. And he goes, um, I was like, oh, yeah, you didn't work. He's like, no, I just got up. I was like, what? He's like, uh, yeah, I have to be completely honest with you. I'm a, I'm a raging alcoholic. And I was like, OK. I was like... <laughs> Okay, and uh, we started talking, and um, we were just, I, I had a list of questions, you know, what's your fav- favourite takeaway? What's your favourite movie? What's your favourite music? And we were just talking for about three hours on the phone, and it was so surreal talking to someone who was kind of part of you, but you've never met before, and you've never seen them, so you've no idea what, who they are. And uh, this is the day that we met, and um, this is actually in my nana's house, and uh, we look really similar. Everyone used to say that I look like my mum, but uh, I think I look more like my dad. Um, we chatted about our family. I didn't know that my nana was Italian and then my granddad was a Russian Jewish immigrant into the UK. There was like some cool stuff there that I had no idea about. And uh, we just spend the day together. And um, oh yeah, this is little Willie as well. This is uh, my nana's doll, but it's, uh, my dad took took care of him then when my nana died and uh, brought him home. And uh, yeah, he used to watch Coronation Street with him. And uh, so basically, um, yeah, so we, we kind of, we, we hit it off straight away, got on great, like, and uh, it was it was a really big day going there because we went over to Manchester first and then drove to a place called Mansfield. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, um, but we drove there like two hours and uh, I was so nervous that we had to stop and accost it and um, I had to have a shit and my shit was black. That's how nervous I was, like, um, it's an honest talk, like, <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> so um what's the next slide there michelle <laughs> moving on and um, so 2015 around the time i was meeting my dad i was also um uh, being contacted by book publishers because i had um uh, an article in the irish times and it was a huge full page spread on my work and i get i kept getting emails in from uh, book publishers while i was over with my dad so it was a really kind of crazy time and um my book came out then in 2016 and we had a big party and things were kind of going great like i actually met my um auntie and uncle my dad's sister the night before this for the first time and they came over for my book launch and uh things started to seem like they were picking up after a bad couple of years like after losing my mom like and then um the following year then next night uh oh, oh, oh yeah next slide yeah, then the following year, I brought out how to deal with poxes on a daily basis. And uh, at this time, um, I was I was booked in for a two-book deal, but uh, I didn't know what my second book was going to be. And I tried to write a story, and uh, my publisher said, maybe just stick to the pictures. And I was like, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then I decided to um, do this book. And um, I didn't realize at the time, but uh, it's just basically a book of all the things that really piss me off and annoy me, which is everything. Um <laughs> 
So it's 200 pages worth of content there of just things that annoy me and, and annoy other people as well, like people eating on the bus, um, you know, people slamming the door in front of your face, like if you're walking into a shop and not holding it open for you. Like, who does that? <laughs> but, um, yes, yeah, so it was a really exciting time. There was things going on, you know, and, you know, things were, like, kind of pushing forward and everything was moving very fast. And then, um, next slide. Then in 2018, I spoke at Offset. And at Offset, um, I I actually really, that was one of my dreams, to speak at Offset. I thought that like speaking at Offset was going to be like the biggest day of my life, the best day of my life, because that's something I've always wanted to do. Might I only have been for 10 minutes now, not the full hour talk, but I still got to the stage and done it. And it was something that I didn't think I'd be able to do because I kind of get nervous doing this stuff as well. It doesn't seem like it. Like, I, I look like this to, to, to all you now. Inside, I'm like, ah! <laughs> that's that's how I feel. Um, so I thought this is the biggest day of my life, and um, a friend of mine came over um, a couple of weeks after this, and um, I basically had been talking to him, and we were gonna set up a magazine, and uh, I was like, yeah, like you know, it's you know, I wanted to get back on track again because uh, my dad actually passed away last October, like, and that was you know, that was some week, let me tell you. My dad dies in the in the week. Uh, I get a kidney stone on Friday the thirteenth, and um, someone tells me uh, sends me a, a hate mail saying that I'm gay and I should come out. Like so, that was a gorgeous week. Um, so um, it was yeah, it was full on. Like so, I kind of went into a real slump and felt really bad. And uh, this was kind of me getting out of it. And I, I actually left out a big part of the story. It got to the stage last year where I was so bad. And I kept constantly telling people that I was depressed in my family, that they weren't listening to me. That I actually broke down and started crying in front of my nana saying, I want to kill myself. Because it was the only way she could actually kind of realize how serious I was about it. Because um, I couldn't articulate like and how I was feeling because I'm not really good with my emotions. And every time I'd say it to someone, they'd be just like, oh, you're grand, you're grand. And um, I knew I wasn't. And uh, I would start going to counselling and uh, I'd be talking to the counsellor and then I'm sure a few of you have noticed here, I'm not looking at you, so I'm looking down at the ground. Um, I was doing that when I was in counselling as well and the counsellor kept looking at the ground, seeing what was there and I go, oh no, that's just a thing I do. And um, absolutely nothing, the counselling didn't do much. I, it, it wasn't really taking it in, um, what she was saying. And I felt like it was just good to kind of go there and talk to someone who would actually listen to me for two hours instead of like interrupting me or like, you know, there was someone who, I, it, was, it was amazing. I got to pay someone to listen to me for two hours. like, And it got to the stage where I thought she was my friend, so I had to leave. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so in 2018, you know, I, I started to pick myself back up and get back on track. And then my friend came over talking about the magazine. And um, he came over and he was all like, we were just coming up with a plan. And he was saying something about himself. And I was like, oh yeah, I do that too. And he'd say something else and i go, and that, and that. I do that as well. Yeah, I do that as well. And uh, he turned around to me and uh, he said, I think you should go for an assessment. And I was like, an assessment? And I was like, for what? What do you think when you see that word, honestly? What's the first thing that comes to your head when you see when you th when you think of that word like where you see it? Exactly. Nobody knows what to say. Um, I didn't know what to say. I had a very stereotypical view of what autism was. Um, I actually just thought of a little boy, or I thought you know, um, someone who had to be taken care of full time, someone who was non-verbal. And uh, as soon as my friend said this to me, I turned around to him and I said, "Fuck off! I'm not autistic. I'd know if I was. I'm 27. Like, do you know what I mean? Like." I think I'd know, like, <laughs> and uh, he goes, no, seriously, Aoife, um, I think you should look into it, and I was like, oh, all right, and uh, I started looking into it, and um, there was one or two things I watched, and I was like, holy shit, I was like, these are like alarm bells kind of going off here now, like, that's that sounds really like me, um, that sounds like me in school, and I just, I became completely obsessed, which is a treat, and uh, morning, noon, and night, I was watching videos, I was reading articles, I was reading, you know, trades. I was looking up absolutely everything because every time I read something, something else related to me or, or resonated with me. And um, it was it was one of those really surreal times because, as I said earlier on the talk, I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew that there was something just different and I didn't know why I was different. 
and I had been looking up stuff for years because a lot of uh, women on the spectrum are underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed or having like bipolar or depression or anxiety and I would have been diagnosed with depression and anxiety and my doctor tried to put me on medication for that but I knew that there was always a reason to why I was feeling those things alongside with the main reason which I found out later that month that uh, I'm autistic and um I think that's why I've had all the struggles in my life because I didn't, you know, I, I'm, I'm after being kind of just plonked in a world that wasn't kind of uh, made for me and I've had to adjust to kind of fit into different kind of perspectives and from all my family and friends, like if I said, you know, oh, I think I have this and I'd be constantly looking up things on Google because I knew there was something and uh, my family were like, geez, you're an awful hypochondriac. You're always looking up things. Your grand does oh, is this another one of your isms? Which my nana said before I found this. God, you should have seen her face when I found out that I was. She felt awful, but um, <laughs> <laughs> she, yeah, she did. But um, it was um, yeah, it was one of those times there. It was like really surreal, like, and I've been told like I kind of adapted myself to the image or the persona that everyone else had of me. So if someone said, you know, oh um, like which my family were quite outspoken, and they'd say things like, you know, oh if you lost a bit of weight, you'd be a gorgeous looking girl. Or if you'd done this, you know, you'd look like this. Or if you would talk like this, or if you do this. And it, everything, a part of my personality was kind of bed out of me or kind of faded away because I was trying so hard to please everyone else and fit into everyone else's idea of who I was. And still am now from people following me on, on Instagram, like, and my Instagram stories, like, you know, I'm animated, like, the way I am in those. But a lot of the time, people don't realise I spend a lot of time at home because... I can't go outside as much. Like even here today, I'll probably sleep for four hours after giving this talk because it takes a lot out of me, like being around people. And I suppose uh, even just as far as, you know, going outside, uh, the noises, like I can't walk to Tesco sometimes without absolutely having a heart attack because all the noises, like even if someone beeps their horn, I am gone, I am gone. So um, there's difficult things like that that I've had to adjust to. But I suppose with finding out this, I, uh, next slide, I am, um, it just says here the secret to life and I'm like finally and then it goes not your life lol and it goes so close <laughs> and that's what it felt like for years that's what it felt like for years that I was like so close to finding out what, what was going on and uh, yet so far away and um, the thing that I uh, that, that you can actually probably show the next slide actually as well you can't read any of this, but um, I'll try to see. I'll see if I can have it on my phone. So I don't. I decided to do a diagram. I, I actually realised throughout my work that I do loads of diagrams of other people to try and understand the world for myself, which is why I suppose some of my stuff would relate to certain people because I talk about things that people are probably thinking but never say. So that uh, that's the kind of uh, I kind of don't have a filter. So that's kind of been handy in my work in that way, and I kind of. I, I have a different way of thinking as well like I kind of like even when I was writing my book I it took me five weeks to write my second book write illustrate and typeset it but I didn't do it on paper like I'd done it in my head and then I put it on the screen so I'm very visual and um, I don't like reading either which I, I can say out loud now I was afraid to tell people that I didn't read books before but I just can't take it in properly like everyone else I I prefer looking at uh, like you know things with pictures in it and that kind of thing I take a lot more in so on this in the top left hand corner it says, uh, I'm different, not less. My brain works in a different way. It can be pretty cool sometimes, but because I have to, I have when I work, I have a super focus, which allows me to excel in anything I put my mind to, including my interests, such as illustration and comedy. So one a special interest is when you're basically, um, you know, you're focused on something, and that's something that you're, it's, all, it's put down as an obsession. So my work is my obsession, which is why I kind of have been doing well in it, because it's all I do. Uh, I lock myself away from people and do that. And then um, sameness and routine are very important to me. So, yeah, I, I, I might have a shit routine, but that's the same. Like, I still get my Goodfellas pizza on every Sunday in the Tesco, you know. And then um, sarcasm and jokes can go over my head. I am the most gullible person you will meet. Like, no joke. Um, I'm a um, very emotional person. And I'm, I, I haven't got a grasp of my emotions. I don't understand them very well. Uh, when I'm really happy, I'm really happy. Sometimes I cry. And then when I'm really sad, I get really sad. Like it's it's almost like the same kind of emotions a child will have. And then like if something goes wrong, um, I have what would look like a tantrum, which uh, my boyfriend put up with seven years of without realizing what the fuck was going on. And now we know, so it's fine. Um, and then um, 
Yeah, I suppose um, finding things uh, difficult that other people find easy. I took up a job in the Hard Rock Cafe there earlier on in the year and I couldn't do it. Uh, I done my training TJ Fridays and I said, no, I was like, I can't do this. This is like, I have to look at people, have to go up and ask them how they are, have to look them in the eye and ask them what they wanted to order, have to bring in plates. What if I drop that plate? Like, you know, the anxiety was 90. So I just had to leave. Like after, I kept telling them I had a bug and that's another thing I kept doing. I kept calling to work sick constantly. And even if I had an internship or anything like that, like my auntie got me an internship in Rothko when I was first starting out and I actually um, kept coming in late and she said, you're making a show of me. And I felt awful. And I actually had a kidney stone at the time. And I was autistic. So I was like, it was a double thing. I really wasn't well. But then I was also mad nervous of going in and talking to people. Because I used to be actually very quiet back then. I've only come out with Michelle in the last couple of years. But um, I suppose I just want to leave you on a, um, the post that I put up the day that I found out I was autistic. I don't know if many people have read it. But I think it kind of um, explains it a bit better. So um, I just thought I would. Um, and I suppose in a weird way, before I read this as well, um, in a weird kind of way, since my dad's died, I found out that my dad was autistic as well for my auntie. And in a strange kind of way, I'm not a huge believer in this, but I am now. Um, I don't want to sound like that crazy angel lady on the Late Late Show. But um, <laughs> um, he, in a way, guided me to find this out as well. And um, I've been getting kind of weird kind of things popping up like it, like boards and basically when he was found there's a piece of paper beside him saying I keep dreaming of boards uh, blue tits like I see them and basically I found a pink feather in my uh, kitchen the other day on his anniversary and uh, a robin flew outside on the bikes when I was having a smoke out there in the smoking area and everyone knows out there there's only a tiny little gap what's a robin doing in there so you know but um, I'm completely sane I swear <laughs> um, so uh, I'll just read this out then um, uh, where is this now oh yeah this is probably the, one of the most difficult things I've ever written, so bear with me, it's a long one. I would appreciate if you took the time to read it. Oh, why am I reading that? Because I'm reading it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's early, leave me alone. Um, have you ever lived through years of your life not fully realizing who, who you are? Most people at first glance see me as someone outgoing, friendly, quirky, funny, and maybe even a little lot of times. They see me as someone successful, someone, oh, Siri, fuck off. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> ruining my mo mojo. Um, most people at first glance see me as, uh, yeah, fair uh, th Yes, a bit little lot of times. They see me as someone successful, someone finding their way in the world and making my stamp on it. Most people see me as an illustrator, graphic designer, author, and comedian, amongst other things, but most people don't see me, and most people will never see me. It's been, I've been wearing a mask my whole life and never knew. As a young child, I immersed myself deeply in drawing and music. Most days I spent hours on end in my room writing stories and learning to play music. No one understood me, but this is how I expressed myself. I was always asked by adults, why don't you smile? There must be something wrong with you. Um, you have nothing to be feeling down about. I was invited to a par uh, to birthday parties where I... Oh Jesus, where is this? I was invited to birthday parties where I would be ridiculed, teased and left out. I couldn't go, on my own, uh, go out my own road to play without bullies literally jumping up and down on my face and my hair being pulled out in clumps in my own front garden. One day I was even lined up so people would slap me across the face like a punching bag, but I got my own back on that bitch because do you know what happened? I leant back and she hit the main bully in her nose start cushion. Just saying. Um, in school, I went, uh, in school, well, that wasn't much better. It was worse. I fell behind so much that I had to do maths in the principal's office. People in my class treated me so badly that I still remember each and every second of it to this day. I was robbed from, uh, I was robbed from and taken advantage of. And there's, there's a, the time when my primary school kicked me out for a month to attend St. John's for troubled children because they didn't know what to do with me. The principal of my school actually said, Bullies, bullying does no harm, sure, toughens you up, she said. I went through years of counselling when I was in primary school and the one, one of the counsellors actually said to my mum, I was just looking for attention. And that was the day that um, pretty much stopped anything that I could have told my mum at that time. Like he, he done his job wrong because my family thought I was just looking for attention and I was struggling massively. So um, it's, it's, there needs to be a lot more education around autism for that very reason. Um, all throughout my life, I uh, corrected on how, I was corrected on how to speak, how to act, how to behave like other children, people my age, and I eventually just started doing that to make life easier for those and everyone else around me. I was frustrated, angry, alone, and things only seemed to get worse and worse by the time I got to secondary school. 
Teacher said, I do nothing with my life, that I was a waste of space. I mimicked people dressed like the coolest person, which whichever uh, group I was hanging out in, which was um, one, a new group every couple of months. I tried so desperately to fit in and make friends. I was completely lost. People who thought they were, my, people I thought who were my friends would call me on private numbers saying horrible shit. But what bothered me was the the, the one minute they were all, we were all friends, and the next I was being treated like this. And to be honest, I I never really knew why. Still to this day, having and maintaining friends is a mystery to me. It's like reading a can of fa- foreign Fanta on holidays, having a clue what the thing says. I don't understand friendship, how friendship works. I mean, I should, I'm an adult, but making friends as an adult is, is much harder. I mean, you can't just go up to someone and ask, can we be friends like you would in the playground when you were six? Most days I spend with my boyfriend at home or uh, alone when he's in work. I, sp- I like spending time doing things I love because they don't let me down. And I've been so immersed in my work that I've forgotten about human interaction in general. Over the last couple of years, I had the same. It had some extreme highs and lows. I lost my best friend, one of the the one person in my life who I could share everything with, the one person who got me. When my mom died in 2013, everything changed. I was at my lowest point in my life, and no one really truly understood. So I got stuck into my work and focused on that because I felt like I had lost everything else. Everything was fucked. People in my class, college, not all, but um, some of them. Uh, completely ignored me and ganged up on me in different points throughout my uh, time there and um, I never felt so much like an outsider as I did in that class with people my own age with similar interests. I may as well have been a fucking alien. Um, I decided in 2015 I wanted to, yeah, that's uh, I wanted to meet my biological dad. I knew nothing about him other than uh, others told me and they weren't kind things, the kind of things that made me go, okay, okay, cool, I want to meet this guy but I wanted to make up my own mind. Uh, when we met in his flat in Mansfield up north in the UK, our eyes met and we just knew that we were related. We didn't talk for a while, but once we both started, we couldn't shut the other up. My dad was a genius at maths and funny enough, a, a pool too. My dad, because he was an alcoholic, he used to wobble like this, so I thought I'd absolutely like like kill him in pool. And then um, because he's autistic too, he was good with all the angles and could literally pot the ball straight away. And um, so basically then, um, yeah, so then... When I came home, we talked on the phone for hours, asking each other questions. And um, then, let me see here. Um, one of my favorite stories of him was um, knowing that some actor in EastEnders back in the 80s was uh, gay and that he knew before everyone else did because he delivered a washing machine to his house. <laughs> um, he, he, all, he, he was almost as random as me and loved a good story. I, I thought my dad was weird, though. He said things you just shouldn't say to your daughter, ever. After uh, a while, we had fallen out because he said some nasty things to me. He actually said, oh, my dad um, said I was going to be an alcoholic, and I can see that in you, too. And he was open, and we actually had a huge falling out over this because um, I was like, what the hell? This before I knew he was autistic. I was like, what are you doing saying those things to me? And we didn't actually get back talking before he died. But... Um, then basically, um, let me see where I am now. Yeah, so then he actually, he, he was a kind person. He told me that I don't need to hold in my tears like his dad told him. He said I could cry even if whenever I wanted to. He said he robbed a doll from Tesco because there was a defect on it. And uh, that was actually the doll that was beside the one that I showed you there. He said he robbed a doll in Tesco because there was a defect on it and it was going to be thrown away. And she didn't want, he didn't want her to be thrown away just because she was different. He didn't know he was different, but he actually identified with the tall like and said like you know no that's not right like so he was a very sensitive person and then um, we were more similar than I could ever have imagined and I'm sorry he didn't get to figure out who he was and instead turned to drink and close himself off to the world and I said on the 30th of April 2018 my life changed it all finally made sense to me it was like the darkness or a brick that had been lifted from my heart after many years of struggling and plodding alone people doubted me but I knew, I knew deep down, for the first time in my life I could take the mask off I've been wearing every day for the last 27 years and breathe for the first time without any anxiety. On the 30th of April, I found out that I'm autistic. You can't see it, you might not even be able to tell, but that's because I'm a master of disguise. And it's also the reason why I'm highly intelligent, despite what I've been told uh, by other people throughout my life. And that's another thing. I, I know that I'm intelligent now, like, and I actually feel confident enough to say that because I've been told I'm stupid all my life. So I'm kind of at a place now where I know that I'm not what everyone else says I am. Um, 
it just means uh, it just means that my brain works a little a little different, and um, basically I find certain mundane things that everyone else finds easy, difficult. I observe the world in a different way. I think in pictures, can play videos in my head, and that's basically how that works. So here's to the people in my life who let me down, who misjudged me, trolled me, hurt me, made me my life hell, who said I was stupid, who told me I was wrong. For the people who failed me, took advantage of me, for the health system who failed me, and other girls and women on the spectrum, for the people who kicked me, punched me, spit me daily because of all this and more, just because I was different, for the teachers who said I'd, I'd be nothing, I, I didn't and didn't ever give me a chance, you couldn't have been more wrong. One thing is for sure, I'm a hell of a lot stronger than I realised, even with everything going on in my life, good and bad, there is one thing that has never changed, and that is that I never gave up on myself. I never stopped searching for the answers despite everyone telling me, oh, you're grand. I never stopped, never give up on yourself. Um, this day is the first day of my life without living with a mask. This is me. I found myself. And um, that's me. Thanks very much.